살면서 꼭 한번 만나야 할 아이비리그 3대 명가 정의 행복 실리 케이건의 죽음 피할 수 없는 죽음의 본질을 파고들기 위해 오늘도 책상 위에 오르는 실리 케이건 Hello, EBS viewers. Welcome to We d a y Han Suap, Great Minds. I'm s h e l l y Kagan. I'm Clark Professor of Philosophy at Yale University. I specialize in moral philosophy. That is to say, I specialize in ethics, the part of philosophy where we try to work out the basic rules of what's right and wrong. Imagine that I were to bring out right now a cat. Uh, and I set the cat on fire. I douse it with gasoline, throw a match at it, and the cat goes up in flames, shrieking in agony until it dies in pain. That's morally wrong. There's something morally objectionable about setting a cat on fire. Now, it's important to understand that when I talk about morally objectionable here, what I've got in mind is the thought that there's something wrong about it, but I don't have in mind whether the question whether or not it's illegal or not. It's one thing to ask whether something is the right thing to do. It's a different thing to ask whether or not there's anything illegal about it. There are a lot of ways that something can be wrong. If I were to have a, a, a go into your house and rip off a leaf from your, or, or, or a, a petal from your, your prize orchid, uh, that would be wrong too. It would be wrong because the orchid, the plant, belongs to you. But if I were, in contrast, to go into your house and pull your arm off, your arm off, uh, we wouldn't merely say, oh, that was wrong because uh, you know, it's mean to your, your family members. We would say, I've done something wrong to you. I owe it to you not to treat you that way. I mean, you know, maybe the cat is owned by somebody, and if I kill the cat, then that may be wronging or treating wrongly the owner of the cat. But even if it's a stray cat, what we'd want to say is that, I am wronging the cat. I am doing something to the cat that I owe it to the cat not to do. We can say that the cat, like you, has a moral standing. It matters morally in its own right. And that's the basic point that I'm trying to have us think about today, that animals count in their own right from the moral point of view. As I say, one way to express this is to say that they have moral standing. Another piece of jargon that we could use is to say that animals have a positive moral status. Another way we could make the same point is by saying that the cat has a moral claim against us. Or if we want to, we could talk in terms of rights and say the cat has a right that I not harm it in this way. And if we ask, all right, very good, the, the cat counts. What I've done is wrong, and not merely wrong. It's wrong, I've done something wrong to the cat. We ask, why is that? Well, the obvious answer is because the cat feels pain when I set it on fire. And same thing if you were to think about a cow or a pig or a mouse or a dog or a bird or a snake. If I cause pain to an animal, I'm doing something wrong to that animal. And so maybe if you've got some reason to want to set the cat on fire, maybe that's okay. But I think that's probably not right either. Imagine that the reason I set the cat on fire is because I like the sound it makes as it shrieks to death in agony. There's a peculiarly wonderful and unique sound, and, and I love listening to that sound. Oh, I hope you have the same reaction that I do when I think about that example, and I want to say, okay, look, the fact that you enjoy the sound is a reason to do it, but it's not a very good reason, and the reason that we've got to not set the cat on fire is a stronger reason than that, uh, and so that's just not a good enough justification. And by virtue of feeling pain, we've now seen they count morally. And what's more, we've seen the fact that they count morally gives us a reason not to harm them. 
a reason that's strong enough to outweigh some of our human desires and some of our human interests. As we can see, I think once you take seriously the thought that animals count morally, that they matter in their own right, that they have moral standing, that we owe things to them, then we find that uh, many of the ways we interact with animals are simply morally unjustified. If animals count, we have to change the way we interact with them. Is it wrong not only to cause pain to animals, but also is it wrong to kill animals? Imagine that we did have a way of killing animals painlessly. We'd want to know, is that wrong too? Because I suppose we would all agree that it's certainly wrong to kill a person, even if we do it painlessly. If I kill you painlessly, what have I done? I, well, I brought your life to an end, and that means I have robbed you of the pleasure that you would have gotten had you lived longer. Imagine that I've got a weak heart uh, and, and my, I'm going to suffer a heart attack. And the doctors have told me, unless I get a heart transplant, I'm going to die soon. So I need a heart transplant. Sadly, there are no available hearts to be used to save my life. But imagine that you have a perfectly healthy heart. I've got a pretty good reason for wanting to kill you. But intuitively, it's just not good enough. It's not morally okay for me to kill another person, even if that's the only way to save my own life. The right to life that people have is pretty strong. All right, let's think about animals now. Here, I bet most people, when they think about this example, will say, yes, that is okay. It is okay to kill a pig, or it is okay to kill a baboon, if that's the only way to save a person. But it wasn't okay for me to kill a person in order to save a person. And if we endorse these ideas, then what we're saying is animals have rights. They have a right to life. They have a right not to be killed. And it, it counts for something serious, but it's not as strong as a person's right to life. A person's right not to be killed is stronger. Well, let's talk about what if I had not just a good reason, but a really good reason. Suppose I had a really amazingly good reason. Suppose that somehow killing you would not only save one person, me, suppose it would save five people. Is that morally okay? Is it morally okay to kill one person if that's the only way to save five other people? Now, there are some views in ethics that say, yes, that is OK. There's a, there's a view in philosophy called utilitarianism. But the simple fact of the matter is that most people, when they think about this case of, of killing one person to get the organs to save five people, most people, when they think about this case, they want to say intuitively, that's just not OK. It's wrong. Your right to life is so strong that it rules out even killing you to save five. This view is not a utilitarian view. Here's another piece of philosopher's jargon. Philosophers sometimes call this being a deontologist. According to deontology, there are certain actions that are wrong, even if the results would be good. Killing an innocent person is wrong, even if the results, as in our example, would be good. All right, so, so when it comes to thinking about people, most of us think that the right to life needs to be thought about in deontological terms. What if by killing one animal, I could save several animals? Can I kill one chicken to save five chickens? I don't know. You know what, what, when I think about that case, that seems like morally perfectly fine. It does seem as though, even though the chicken has a right not to be killed, even though you can't kill it for no reason or even a weak reason, 
if you've got this good reason, this really good reason that killing the chicken would save five chickens, it seems as though that's morally okay. So when it comes to thinking about chickens, we tend to not think in deontological terms. We tend to think in utilitarian terms. And that's different from how we were thinking about the situation with regard to people. Now, and this is a controversial matter, and there's obviously different positions that we could take. You know, one, one possible view that's worth thinking about is utilitarianism for animals, deontology for people. And so utilitarianism counts animals. It counts animal suffering. It gives animals a kind of right not to be killed. But for all that, it gives them a different kind of right that the deontologists want to give us. So maybe we need to have one kind of moral theory, utilitarianism, when it comes to animals, and another kind of theory when it comes to deontology, another kind of theory when it comes to people. Although it's wrong to kill one person to save five, ask yourself the following question, what if I could save not five people, but 10 people, or 100 people, or 1,000 people, or a million people, or a billion people? At some point, does the right not to be killed get outweighed? If so, although we all have a right to life, it's not absolute, it's not infinite. And from that point of view, maybe we should say the right not to be killed has a threshold, an amount of good such that if that amount of good is at stake, that amount of good is at stake, it becomes permissible to harm and kill the innocent person Maybe animals also have deontological rights, but the deontological rights have a lower threshold. As I say, these are complicated and controversial questions, but they suggest to me at least that although we do want to take animal ethics seriously, it may be that the right way to think about the ways in which animals count is to hold the view that they count for less. You are the kind of being who has preferences about what you want to have happen in your life, about small things and large things. You have choices that you make about what to have for dinner. You make choices about what kind of clothes to wear. You make choices about where to go on vacation next week. You are, here's a piece of philosopher's jargon, you are an autonomous being. Animals, I think, pretty clearly are less autonomous than people are in typical circumstances. But that's not to say that they're not autonomous at all. I think the right position to take here is to say that autonomy is something that comes in degrees. And an animal, different types of animals, will be more or less autonomous. And depending on how autonomous they are, uh, uh, it'll be worse. If they're more autonomous, it'll be that to that extent worse to kill them than it would be to kill a less autonomous animal. You probably have views about what you want to be doing 20 years from now or 30 years from now. Uh, but and animals may not have those kinds of complicated views about the distant future. But animals do have preferences about what they want to be doing tomorrow. Your dog has preferences about how it wants to spend its day, you know, where it wants to be lying down, which squirrels it wants to be chasing, or whatever it might be. Animals have preferences about what they want to have happen in their life. They're not autonomous to the extent that we are, but they are somewhat autonomous. And to the extent that we realize that they too have autonomy, Given, then, that one moral obligation is to respect and honor the autonomy of people, we then similarly have to respect and honor the autonomy of, of other beings. Now, of course, including animals. It's plausible to think that animals count. They have a future that's good for them. If I kill them, I'm robbing them of it. They have preferences. They have autonomy to some degree. If I kill them, I am destroying and overriding and disregarding their autonomy. Animals count, but they count less than people do. You know, I've been emphasizing the thought that animals count, but they count less. And this is a controversial view in the philosophy, that, the, the, the subfield of moral philosophy that thinks about animal ethics. This is a controversial view. And I think it's something closer to the common sense view. What I've suggested, one of the reasons I've hammered away at this over the last couple of lectures, I hammered away at the point that 
animals count, but they count less, is it seems to me that's just not the right philosophical view. And that has practical significance because if, as I certainly do hope, if we're going to get people persuaded to take animal rights more seriously, it's going to be harder to do that because if, we, if we're going around saying they count every bit the very same way that people do, that's so implausible that the likely result's going to be people are going to go running in the other direction and say, so it must be animals don't count at all. If your only choices are animals count like you and I do or animals don't count at all, I'm worried that the majority of people are going to say animals don't count at all. But you know, whether or not the majority would say it, it also just seems to be a false view. The kind of view that I've, I've been sketching over these couple of lectures, I mean, to, to really work the arguments out is a far more complicated thing to do. Uh, as it happens, I wrote a book uh, defending this kind of hierarchical view uh, called How to Count Animals More or Less, suggesting as uh, you know, that title does, that animals count, but they count in varying degrees. They count less than people, not all animals count the same. I think in terms of understanding the truth about ethics, that's an important thing to get straight. In terms of achieving the practical goal of actually changing our behavior to take animals seriously, we'll never really accomplish that unless we understand the truth and, and work out the details of a hierarchical view.